Stop in the lay-by and enjoy Jules and Jim's Joyride. In the arena of greatness, we think of Caligula for his cruelty, mm. for Nero for his impulsiveness, yeah. and Solomon for his wisdom. Yes. But of course, in wisdom, we think of one man for true greatness, an amazing player of music, an amazing writer of music, an amazing producer of music, and also a man that's unbelievably, as well as that, has written comedy series. He is my dear friend who's here today, Nitin Sawney. Oh, hi. <laughs> well, what an introduction, Nitin. Yeah, we were it's... expecting that. No, because I didn't actually write the comedy. I was one of the. Well, I was originally uh, like a writer with Sanj, who you know really yes. well. With Sanji Basco, we had a we had a show ages ago called. Well, we were called collectively the Secret Asians. Um, although some people actually missed that altogether and called us the Secret Agents. <laughs> like when I when I had um, I had an album called London Undersound, and people say your album London Underground is kind of like yeah. totally missing. Yeah. Missing the point. But yeah, we we kind of uh, we toured up and down the country ages ago, and then and then when um, was this? What period? Are you talking well, this about? is about. Oh, blimey, it's like early early nineties. I think. Um, I think when, I remember seeing you somewhere. Well, we we were at the Oval House, and we played Waterman's in Brentford and and Tom Allen Centre. In East London, and then we played. Uh, we we went around the country quite a bit, and it was just like I mean, you know, to be honest with you, I always just thought it was like having fun with a mate because Sanj and I went to college together, and we'd known each other a long time. I did the Radio Four series with them for a couple of years, and then I kind of, um, but this wasn't my. <laughs> then you drifted into music. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's like no, I was already, I was obviously making albums in, in bands already but I kind of um, it was a weird aberration which is kind of like a surreal blot in the landscape when I kind of think back we were talking earlier on about but you know being in bands and stuff traveling around what did you two go around on a tandem that yeah it would be great up to up to Manchester no um uh, mainly it was uh, vans and I think it was mainly vans occasionally the train but I think because we we started using a few props and then you'd have to get in vans and stuff or or Sanja take us up in his car yeah you see it's, it's a side of show business the general public don't usually see mm. how the person actually travels because it is all mm. about travel I mean that's part that's the key to everything in whether it's whether it's music whether it's comedy uh, acting you've got to get in and get a long way in a cheap van in a cheap van to start with but in the early 90s we went we became mega superstars and went off on big tours in a huge luxury bus with TVs and kitchens lounges yeah. and all that stuff and and so do a lot of bands and and people like that, but no one ever tells them that it's them who's paying for it. Yes, yes. <laughs> and at the end of this ma mega star tour, you have got four and nine months so, <laughs> for yeah. pay. So if you, and that's why people with the right frame of mind go around in a, in a, the worst crappy transit van they can find <laughs> that yes. they've bought for fifty pounds at the back of loot. Yes, I know. I think I think that's the thing because the novelty initially is like you you go with. Is it Phoenix? I mean, you go with these amazing kind of tour buses that will have all the bells and whistles, but then after a while, reality kicks in. And you think, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going back to a split a bus. <laughs> so, but it was. Um, but having said that, I mean, I, I did. I've done quite a few few amazing uh, tours in tour buses and found myself in the most beautiful locations because you you do overnighters. You're on on these sleeper buses and you wake up in some random place. And one time, I remember waking up in somewhere in Switzerland and and just looking out at these beautiful snow-capped mountains. It was just an amazing way to wake up. Amazing. I love it. That. I was in a cafe once in on the lakes of Geneva with a bottle of Evian. And, uh, you sound like an advert. And then... And then <laughs> As our new looking, sponsors. <laughs> looking out of the window, I could see the same mountain. On, that was really? on the bottom. Oh, yeah. oh wow! You were living the dream. I oh, think. Yeah. That's, I think that's like living. I like. I do quite like that with, with transport. With a lot of things, living the brochure style life. So, yeah. but often it can be a very that's old. What, that's what you love on your grave. <laughs> yes. You live the brochure style life. <laughs> and, 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 and that's life. Uh, it, yeah, it's a brochure style life. And I'm and I'd like to thank the co cooperative uh, <laughs> funeral services for putting me in, in, well? in, the, in the G in the, in the GTX model uh, um, <laughs> a funeral vehicle. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I living the life from the adverts and particularly with transport. And it wouldn't really matter, you know, if I looked at an aeroplane, uh, sort of 
advert from the 1960s when mm. when it was glamorous to travel by plane mm. i'd want to be uh sort of on the top deck of the 747 sipping cocktails with people with sort of big hair and and um and, and black wearing sort of dinner jackets which i think they're supposed to water fly exactly which you wore to fly the same with a vehicle if and even if when i was in the in squeeze when we were going around in transit vans i'd look at the transit van brochures and see people with a, a set of a blue overalls, flat cap, and th- a pencil in the top pocket, and think, "Yeah, that's us, ready for work." But anyway, um, that was talking about the how we 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 the, the method of of travelling around. But I think Nitin, you're quite a keen cyclist as well, aren't you? Well, yeah, I, I've, I've I've recently bought an electric bike, which is I mean I I love cycling anyway, but it's kind of uh, I think it just just made me phenomenally lazy. Which is which is quite bad. I kind of thought, you know, my thinking behind it was, you know, I'm not cycling enough. I want something new to kind of reinvigorate me and kind of get me more into it. But it's um, it's amazing. It's just it's an amazing thing because also my my thinking was that I'll go I'll go somewhere quite far and uh, you know and sometimes you get you you kind of think I oh, know I can't be bothered to cycle all that way back and it's kind of like it becomes a chore on the way back with this it doesn't matter how far you go you can you can get back to wherever you want to go and it's quite nice is this going to be the future of motorcycling (laughs) well it might be actually do you think i mean i've got i well i've got two motorcycles i can't think there isn't an electric one yet is there uh, I mean, yeah, there is. There's is one that? I saw recently, which is, uh, well, I could tell you all about it, but it sounds like we're advertising everything. It's from Selfridges at 15 grand, actually. Is it really? I saw it recently. Where's it from? It's, wicked. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the gadget department. But yeah, no, I really? saw it. Really? Yeah. A full, like, 500 cc. It looks really futuristic. But it doesn't have any cc because it's electric, isn't it? Yeah, no, but, uh, you know, the, well, is it like there's not just an electric bicycle? It goes up to 95 miles per hour. Yeah. That's something like that. I That's bet it doesn't look that good. It looks cool. Does it? I think so. I'll go and check it out. <laughs> you never know. I mean, I think... Maybe they'll send us one free and give it a, a run. A well, run it's run available out. in Selfridges. <laughs> uh, I did go to an auction of bicycles because I was after a <clears throat> Dursley Pedersen. The, That's... <laughs> uh, a Dursley Pedersen. And I can safely say this, um, they're not our sponsors because they went out of business, I think, probably 70 years ago. Uh, I was at a Dursley a a sale looking at a Dursley Pedersen, which is one of these vintage sort of strange bone shaker looking bikes, and there was a penny farthing. And I don't think that's the right name for them. It's a proper name. Is it? Is there's, there's another name? Oh, is that a generic name? Oh, yes, not? yes. I, I think there's a. It's like an ordinary or large something. wheel, small, small, small something wheel. like that. Anyway, anyway, I said, well, I'll have a go. Okay, at that's that. a chunk of large wheel, small wheel. Large wheel, small wheel. Can you say that? Do it right. You try it, Nate. Large wheel, small wheel. Yes, perfectly. Quicker. Large wheel, small wheel. Large wheel, small wheel. I can't talk that. Large wheel, small wheel. Large wheel, small wheel. Large wheel, small wheel. Yes. I got it. Large wheel, small wheel. Yeah, go on. Um, As you were saying. So I tried to climb on top of this. The the auctioneer said, oh, it's perfectly simple. And he pushed the penny farthing. And then once you'd got to a certain speed and the velocity was reached, you then sort of mounted it like you mount like yeah. a horse i suppose anyway i tried this and i just started running behind it and it was just too frightening to get the or suddenly yeah, to get imagine. that high and then when you stop well you, you just fall over sideways well, it's, your ankle. Cause, cause it's about six foot high i, I mean the seat isn't it and what are you five foot two <laughs> something like that well yeah but three foot maybe <laughs> have you been on one do you know what my one of my i think my great 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 grandfather was a world champion penny farthing cyclist wow that's amazing. That terrified me. I've got no evidence of, of this. It's just my dad told me. That's this. amazing. Yeah, no, that's good enough. Do you have any interesting relatives from the past that were, uh, can match such a boast? No, no, I don't think. Any, <laughs> I, don't think I don't think any of us have. Well, no, I did. Um, you know, uh, who do you think you are? Yeah, and did, did they come up with him? Well, they did the pilot on me because of my ridiculous past lineage. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it involves kings and so forth. But that's a that's really? the other side. Which 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 king? <coughs> Edward the Seventh. Oh wow! My is he gran- your father? No, my grandfather used to uh, stand guard outside his bedroom whilst he was with a maid, and oh, wow. get half a crown for it, because my 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 grandfather's parents were head butler and head maid at various grand houses around, and my grandfather got run over by the lord and lady of a particular house. In Rickmansworth, and they didn't have a kid, so they said, "Can we raise um, my grandfather?" Wow! So, yeah, so they did the Gosh. pilot on me. Right. So you discovered all this? You didn't know? Well, I knew it all. We oh, knew did. it all anyway. Oh, right. But you okay. got to pretend you. <laughs> I've never heard it before. You're giving and it then away. weep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Spoiler alert. 
But music can have, of course, a very strong effect. Music can make people weep, can't it? I mean, yeah, I get very moved by music, obviously. Mm. I mean, like, um, um, you know, some composers do that to me, you know, a lot. And and, and I think it's interesting because... Um, um, I think French Romantic, um, Debussy... Um, oh, Debussy, uh, Apri, 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 weep any day. Yeah, L'Apre Midi d'Enfant, you know, like some of these kind of beautiful uh, kind of orchestral pieces. Reva- just... Ravel's Piano Concerto oh. in G, that yeah, would get oh, yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was playing... Uh, and we, By the way, we're not going to play any examples of this on the programme because we haven't paid for the clearance. But so we'll just hum it. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'll, well, I'll, start, I'll start humming Ravel's Piano Concerto in G, you yeah. join in. The German Requiem by Brahms, if yeah. you could just hum that. To give mm. a bit of thank you, yes. mm. But I was playing that in the car, you see, and the, it's a bit rainy, and I'm in a traffic jam, and there was just a woman with a small child in the rain and listening to that music, oh. it was completely unrelated events, but I almost felt like crying. Mm. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't offer them a lift because they'd have thought I was weird, you know. <laughs> but open the window and they had Brahms belting out and you weeping. Yeah. Yeah. So, get, get, get in my for... car, get in. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, here's, I'll tell you an interesting... You probably know these. I'm going to give you a couple of Eric Sarty facts. Mm-hmm. You know he was mad. Quite, um, yeah. quite mad. Yeah. Well, he had two grand pianos and he kept one on top of the other one. And the one on, on the top he used to keep his unpaid bills in. Really? Which he, well, we all do that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and also, he only ate white food. Did you he know only that? Ate white food? Only white food, like oh. potatoes, um, My daughter used egg, to do that. egg white. Food racism. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, he had some theory that all, it, 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 good for you if you only ate white food. No, I know a couple of people like that. Really? It's, it's quite common. I'm right? on a brown food diet, which yeah. is... Uh, beef, brown bread, sprouts. But sprouts are green. Not the way I cook them. <laughs> <laughs> Fell into that one, didn't you? I certainly did. <laughs> uh. so, so, like, so, like, synesthetic. So, like, I worked with a pianist called Helene Grimaud, who's an amazing classical pianist, and she's synesthetic to the point where colours really disturb her if they're wrong, you know, around when she's playing a certain piece of music, and she uses that to memorise. Um, you know, like a whole massive repertoire as well. It's kind of like this this idea that you have colour association and kids, um, they learn uh, sometimes perfect pitch through colour association. I visited Bach's birthplace. Mm-hmm. And of course, it was it was very modest, his birthplace. Right. And it was in Eisenach, mm. in Old East Germany. This is last year. Um, and there's the Wartburg Castle on top of the hill there, which, of course, as we all know, where they'd have the big singing contest and Wagner based the Tannhauser on the singing contest. Over there. And if you didn't win, I think they used to chuck you over the battlements, but that's another story. And then down in the little village, and it's like almost like a Disney cartoon, a castle on the hill and this little village, which Eisenach's a bit bigger now, also home to the Wartburg factory, which is another little motoring fact, the Eastern European the vehicle. The Wartburgs. Wartburg cars, yeah, made there. Yeah. Um, and... Um, a nice picture, just while we're on transport, nice picture of Herbert Austin, who started Austin Cars, visiting the Wartburg factory before the war. Um, anyway, same place where Bart comes from. But the point was, although he'd made all this fantastic music, unlike his um, contemporary handle, mm. he never went anywhere. He wasn't keen on transport. So he really just stayed in he Germany. He used to walk. A he lot, used to though. walk everywhere. Yeah, and right, his first yeah. big walk was he, he was orphaned, and him and his two brothers, the, the, his parents were the town musicians, but they died, and they had a letter saying we, to, of introduction to the, to the music school. So they walked to Leipzig, which is maybe 120 yeah. miles away. Yes, yeah, right. Aged yeah. eight, aged ten, mm. through the forests, past witches, which they had in those How days, far was and it? giants that they had in those days, yeah. and, um, and <laughs> trolls and the lot, and they walked all of that way. 120 miles when they're little lads like that. Did they walk that for fun or for... No, they'd been orphaned. Oh, they were orphaned. They were orphaned and they were going to wasn't introduce... wasn't an afternoon stroll. <laughs> no, no, it was... It, and then, but they, they, they thought, well, they've got to do something. So they, they walked all that way, got to Leipzig, pre- presented the letter saying, this is young Bach and his brothers, please, he's quite good at music, could he come to your school? And they laughed at him. They laughed at him. They're not laughing now. But Nedin, you also, when we were talking earlier, you said uh, that you you travelled abroad um, yeah. and, and, and and quite like travelling. Yeah, it? well, actually, I mean, it's interesting when you talk about planes because one and, and Sanjeev Bhaskar, because we were we went on a Concorde flight together uh, as the, as the British Airways giveaway. I won a trip on Concorde, which was quite mad, and uh, I think we were just kind of we were just so blown away by the whole concept. And we were just kind of staring around us in disbelief that we were on Concord and all these co- kind of commuters who regularly took it were just kind of just sitting there kind of very casually and we were just shouting at each other across the aisles, just kind of very excited, probably just uh, 
you know, hacking everyone off on the flight. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've flown a lot. And um, my biggest, I think my biggest trip was in about, I think it was 2001, where I went around the world. I met Nelson Mandela. I spent time with Aboriginal Australians, uh, Native Americans in, in uh, on Mount Shasta in, in near Sacramento. When I was traveling around, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, planes to get between countries, but even sometimes internally as well, planes sometimes. I mean, it was everything, you know, um, trains. I mean, uh, around India, it's a real experience to get trains. It's quite crazy. Is it as mad as it looks? Uh, I've only ever seen, you know, I've never traveled And cars, India, cars in India. I mean, it's like medieval jousting, you know, because people are, when, when they're coming at you uh when they're when they're um driving on the main roads i mean the main roads are are really not very i mean in a lot of places they're just there's no real road there it's just kind of like a a load of rubble (laughs) so you kind of so it can be really bad and and you're kind of driving through and people will will avoid each other by driving through ditches and all kinds of stuff so I, i got used to this when i was about eight years old and um and I mean, I, I all kinds of transport at that age because I, I, I went on my first elephant uh, going up to. Uh, Hang on, that's a first. Well, that's, a, <laughs> that's a first. For Which this I show. heard you've been on an elephant before. I've been on an elephant, yeah, but it, it was it was a holiday experience, you know, in Thailand where you right. you get taken on, a, you know, you walk around a, up and down a river. But you, what did you use it as actual transport? Well, we were going up to a palace in in Jaipur. And the thing is that you're you're on the side of this. You're on the side of the elephant, and you're you're literally on the edge of a cliff. And so it feels like oh, you're like, hanging off this on yeah, one of the side yeah, seats. Exactly. So your legs are dangling over the edge, and you're looking straight down, which is terrifying. So you, so I remember, and the and the elephants aren't the most steady kind of creatures because they're all also really overworked, you know. So so the thing is going up there. And these these elephants just crapping in front of you the whole time. It's just such a weird experience. So I remember that. The weirdest, I I suppose, in India, I mean, when I was about eight years old, I was on the back of a horse at my uncle's wedding. And when you're you're that age, you're kind of like a, a mascot at a wedding. So it's called a savala. And I remember there was a brass band around us in this village playing When the Saints Go Marching In, which was a very trippy thing <laughs> for an eight-year-old. And, and so badly that I actually, <laughs> being a really precocious kid who played a lot of classical piano, was uh, started crying. I said, I said, there was what, your weeping. because it was so bad? There was your weeping. Well, because it was so bad? Or because it was so <laughs> yes, good? Oh, really? because it was so bad. Because they were playing that. Uh, what, so and I was please, child, please, please, like please, torture. Please, please, yes, please. No, 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 no. I, I mean, I was not focusing on the on the horse experience. I was focusing on this terrible br- uh, brass band. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, India's, India's a crazy place for transport. It's uh, I've had so many weird experiences there. But you were saying that you went to, on your world trips, you say you went both to, to the outback to visit the Aboriginal folk in the... Yeah. And the... And Nelson Mandela. I mean, look, incredible people to visit. Yeah. I mean, when you're visiting um, uh, sort of people, you you have to sort of think about what car you're going to or vehicle you're going to be in because you don't want to look too flash, but you don't want to look too hopeless. Um, so that did that sort of uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, what you were in. Yeah. Well, I mean, like with the with the, going to Arnhem Land in Australia, you you have to go in by plane. So that's initially, and then you'll be you're picked up in a jeep, and the jeep is also how I got to uh, Nelson Mandela's house. So I kind of literally was reading the last book of his, uh, last page of his book, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, in the car, and I kind of, uh, in the Jeep, and then I just kind of finished the last page and then was led straight out to meet him, which was a very weird thing. It's like seeing a, the main character of a book you've just that been reading strange. come to life. Yeah. Which was, uh, which was mad, but amazing as well. So, yeah. And he, he, must, have, was, he, he must have been a fascinating man to meet. Oh, my God. He, it, he was very funny, first of all, which I was surprised by, because I... I He's he's very statesmanlike in the book, and then he's got he's still got that kind of gravitas. But he was, um, I remember his um, his uh, secretary came into the room and said, uh, "The president's on the phone to speak to you." And he looked at me and said, "How many more questions have you got?" And I said. Uh, two or three and he goes oh can you ask him to call me back in 10 minutes cool. which was a very humbling moment and that's where I actually felt quite weepy because I thought wow because I because I thought wow he's a true egalitarian he truly saw people as equal and I thought I'd never see that in a politic. you know I'm quite cynical about politics and politicians and that's when I thought this is the same guy I, I've been reading about so that was an amazing thing so yeah once we did uh, we did the G8 conference and President Clinton and Mrs. Uh, Clinton were there, and he was charming, I have to say, and he looked you straight in the eye, and like you felt like he was listening to every word you said. There was a little sort of drinks party, and uh, my ho- saxophone players surrounded him uh, and were talking to him, because he played the saxophone, Bill Clinton, did you see? Wow. Yeah. And they were talking to him really close up over in the corner of the room, 
and this went on and on and on. And then the room was thinning out, and there was no one left at the party. And it was just like his, you could tell, like CIA blokes or whatever they are, they got on their walkie talkie, you know, like ear, ear pieces. And he's going to get the sax out. Yeah, he's, you know, that's right. Exactly. He's going to get the sax out. Or just checking the DNA of my saxophone players, make sure there's nothing dodgy about them. Anyway, so they're talking to, and he, and in the end, the whole place, and he was still talking to them in this, in this huddle. And there's just me and the sort of CIA bloke standing in the corner. <laughs> and eventually he left. And I said, that's amazing. He talked to you. He said, you, you, you four people. People had more time with him. There's people who would pay five million dollars for that for half an hour with the president, like you've had the most so powerful man in the world. You know, sax talk. Yeah, it was also. <laughs> and I said, what did you did you ask him? All the important, you know, what did you ask him? The Roswell alien, legit or not? You know, all that sort of question. <laughs> yeah. you had, you, you're there. You could ask anything. No, you want. Him what reads he? Yeah, is. exactly. <laughs> is your, did... How's your rumbature? Boring. <laughs> <laughs> And now a message from our sponsors. Now look here, my trousers are the Rolls Royce of slacks. They certainly are aerodynamic, family friendly and low emission. <laughs> One of the most embarrassing motoring moments I've ever had. Oh. I'd got um, a new Range Rover and I'd, and I'd just put me, my parents in the back of it and said, let's go for a drive. And we, go, we went down to Great Stone on Sea, which is a huge mile flat area of sand off the Kent coast. And I said, let's take, it's a Range Rover, it's four-wheel drive, we'll go onto the sand. And it was brand new. I just had it a day, went onto the sand and it sank <laughs> gently oh, no. up to the axles in on, in the beach. But it's supposed to have the best wading capabilities of any off-road vehicle in its Not class. in quicksand. <laughs> That must be. So, ter- I'm not kidding. I mean, that must be terrifying. Well, it was, and I said, yeah. and so my mum and dad are sitting in the back seat, and I said, oh "I'll go." And, there's a coast guard just. Up, I was going to go and ask them. Went to the coast guard, and the coast guard said, "Go to the pub. There's plenty of people with tractors in there, and they've obviously got a deal on because this Same happens ha- quite a lot." But how did you get out of? The, I'm, oh, I'm it, was, it was sand, but it, you could still walk. Oh, it, right. It, it oh, just okay. sank. So I'm and then looking back at my mum and dad sitting in the back seat as I'm. <laughs> <laughs> on the shore, and I'm talking to these. I'm going to the pub, and I said, I've, "I'm afraid I've sank into the sand." So one of the sailors, the tractor driver, sailors, sailors, said to the said, said to the other one, "George, it's your turn." So he, he goes, "Right, two hundred quid," oh. and that was to pull me out oh on God. his tractor. So they can charge whatever they want. To pull fools just wait out for of people, to just, yeah, yeah. But when, like you said, when you said you put your parents in the Range Rover at the beginning yeah. of that, I was imagining them like they were just sort of enjoying themselves watching the television, and you just lifted them out from the television and inserted yeah. them. In well, the, kind of, of, maybe that was. I just said, do you want to go for it anyway? That was embarrassing for me, for them, for the, you know. Was that the, whole the first thing. time they'd ever been out with you? In, in yeah, in, in that car, <laughs> and I found a photograph of it the other day, which brought it all back to me. Anyway, that was the most embarrassing motoring moment of my life years ago i was in the car with uh i think mira Sial was in the front um sanju basco's wife yeah. and uh brilliant comedian um an actress but um yeah i was in the um i was in the back of the car and i'm arachnophobic um so the thing is we we're on the motorway i mean i'm a lot better now right because <laughs> i i get therapy i've had therapy since but um at the time uh i could not deal with the idea of a spider being in a confined space with me so a spider kind of came down from the uh, roof of the car in front of me. And instead of like doing what a normal person would do if they had a problem with the spider, just kind of wave it away or whatever, I tried to get out of the car in the middle of the... Uh, what, on the motorway? On the motorway. Yeah. Wow, that's because screaming I was that a really high-pitched scream. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I should imagine. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of the pitch of my scream at the time, but I think, it, yeah. I mean, it was, that was... Sanjeev was driving. No, uh, no, it, he wasn't there, but it was, um, it was a... a uh, bass player that driving. I was working with Shrikant yeah. Sriram but yeah I mean like uh, and then somebody had the presence of mind because realised that they, they knew I was arachnophobic and saw what it was because I was literally try- I had no concept of what I was doing I just needed to get away from the spider wow terrifying so that's, that's the, that that's is real arachnophobia and extremely then. embarrassing yeah. although if I, my friend um, Leo Sayer I was ringing right. him the other day just drop a name there if I may yeah. Yeah. and he was, uh, he's in Australia and mm-hmm. I get through I tried to look at the time I said have I got you a good moment because he was coming on tour with us, you know, we wanted to talk about what we were going to do. And he said, well, actually, no. He said, it's, the timing's all right. He said, it's not. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning, whatever, whatever. It was perfectly a reasonable time to call. He said, but it's not a good moment because I'm, in the, I'm under, underneath the building where I live uh, in the car park and I've just got in my car and shut the door 
and on the wing mirror of the car there is a huge just as just hanging off the wing mirror of the car is a huge huntsman spider oh which my is God, a no. huntsman's a massive yes it's wow. like the size of your hand sort of thing he said and so i don't know what to do i want to drive off with this like kind of you know well, i don't know so I've, he said i've rung the, the security of the front of the building and i'm waiting for them to arrive <laughs> so what to get rid of it well to deal with the situation what would if, you have done if I'd have been, I would have. I would have. It was on the wing mirror. You were right, right with yes. spiders. I would have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It wouldn't have bothered me. I would have. Cared. But if I was terrified, I would have. I would have backed the car, driven through the underground car park, and and clipped the wing mirror <laughs> on a post, <laughs> therefore destroying the huntsman spider. But what you might do is you might smash, enrage it. You might smash the wing mirror, <laughs> which the... cost you a lot, and enrage the spider. <laughs> yeah. And which the then, time, then increases which, in size tenfold. <laughs> yes, exactly. well, that's what they do, the double in size. And, your entire car. And, uh, and then, but then also, when you smash the wing, the wing mirror, it, it then rebounds and smashes oh. the glass on your window. So he climbs through there and gets you. I knew there was a flaw well, in my well, yeah. plan. There's two things about this because so, I, I actually the reason I know I'm a lot better now was was I think the pitch of my scream had, had gone down a bit when I actually saw probably the biggest spider I've ever seen come out of the uh the dra- when i was in a place in india um a couple of years ago i was having a shower and this spider came came flying out of the uh, drain flying and, out? yeah i mean really fast oh. and, and and like just shot across the ground and i was like i mean i i did scream but it was but i kind of managed to keep presence of mind which i hadn't been able to do a few years before when i had uh, since i had therapy but it's it it's such a strange thing because you you kind of have this uh, sense of kind of uh, i don't know you, you kind of it's like a dissociative experience you can't you, you no longer feel like you're in your body it's kind of, it's just the weirdest thing yeah, yeah, i, I kind of like i like spiders i've got my two daughters one of them especially hates spiders and i right. say well what do you, do you prefer flies because mm. they're getting rid of the flies for you it's very dad sort of thing to say <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrified of spiders well you hate flies it really doesn't help at all I'm afraid it doesn't help my situation it doesn't help my fear it doesn't help me deal with it thank you very much dad yeah right so that's what your therapist said con- to you not to be confused with arachibutrophobia which I found out is a fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth well, so- that doesn't sound too good either <laughs> well we're all, we're all frightened of that weird, mm. weird phobias do you, mm. do you, what's the weirdest phobia you've I don't know. I mean, that, I can't bear polystyrene rubbed together. Oh, really, oh, <coughs> me neither. Or how about a, a paintbrush with all the brushes taken out, rubbed up a blackboard the wrong way? No, yeah. that's equal. Yeah, 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 what is yeah, it yeah about, that's horrible. Yeah, but what is it? There's something about... What does that yeah. sound? Back in the, the times of our, in evolution, yeah. we've, we've, <laughs> we live in the fear of high-pitched squeaks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, what is that about? <laughs> did you what about speaking of transport but and thinking what do we there was a little while ago the the, the strange obelisk not obelisk a monolith. Uh, monolith monoliths in utah and romania yeah exactly yeah that's appeared. right which is so, so uh and and which like not unlike the one in 2001 yeah yeah with the, with the, the which i think it's a copy of uh, yeah um and, but anyway what sort of transport do you think they used to get it there well i think an invisible helicopter because no one could actually no one's actually said that they saw how these got there because they're massive great things i mean they're like 13 foot high or something like that and the one from utah has actually disappeared now so yes. somebody's picked it gone back to pick I, it up i read that somebody they, took they're, it they're, away like, wo- they're like stonehenge aren't they yeah yeah well there's two of them there's only two of them at the moment but maybe but the stonehenge one they're like icebergs they've got there's, there's the same well, amount yeah, under yeah, the yeah. ground that's that's um there we are there's an interesting bit of transport to think early talk about early transport because the Stonehenge ones, in all the pictures that we see in our in our very well informed and accurate Ladybird books, show the loincloth clad henge folk pushing the stones on lo- on on trees that had the branches cut off that it could use as rollers to roll them along on, uh, because it was oh, just prior, I think, to the full invention of what we call the wheel. Yeah. But is this how they did the pyramids, though? Is this the same? So what? Same, they same said, blokes. But they used water, didn't they? You know, they, they used water to help the motion yeah. of the wheels or whatever, from what I recall. But it's kind of like... Um, but it was just... Like, and I heard recently, it wasn't slaves that they used. It was everyone was in on it, and that's how it worked so well. They were all, like, top top flight engineers. 
Well, the but whole it, lot but, of uh, but how, cities but, built but, around but, pyramids but, to just how can put we together? know who who they were? You know what their what their names were. That the von Daniken like theory of them being aliens or whatever. You know, but it is kind of mad because there's such precision with the architecture. Because I think the the uh, Great Pyramid has got it's it's a very precise figure, which is um, which is the exact. Um, I can't remember, is it cubic inches or whatever? They talk about the the precise uh, uh, number of days of the year, including a leap year or whatever. And it's it's very precisely engineered in terms of the diameter of it. Incredible and, engineering. And it all was yeah. all covered in alabaster. Yeah. So it would reflect the sunlight back out into the I mean, space. How, how, you know, how in the middle of the desert does does anyone come up with that? I mean, it's crazy. Anyway, also, it's curiously like, enough... And why? The, but, yeah, but yeah, curious enough, uh, you will both maybe be familiar with the <laughs> mysterious standing stones at Boroughbridge in Yorkshire on the side of the yeah, A1. The, the dev- devil's arrows? Yes, uh, but which which are laid out in an exactly the same geometric form, the three of them. And they're huge, great stones, which predate Stonehenge, I believe. Right. Uh, but laid out in a geometric form which is exactly the same as the three pyramids. In other words, there's two right. that are aligned and there's one that's slightly mm. gone askew. <laughs> um, well. Where they sort of... But they've and yeah, all, all aligned the same, but they're in, in Yorkshire. It's, I think the stones, are uh, ancient stones and their movement, is, uh, and I think there's a book there somewhere on, on how they move them around and then how the people were moved around that moved them around. So I think that's what's nice about this programme, and if I may say so, rather reassuring. That some people would discuss would be, would be discussing the pyramids in one form, but we're just working out the sort of transport issues, which are let's face it, very important. You know, it's it's often overlooked, but historically, I think probably a diesel engine. What they didn't have diesel then? Well, well, maybe some maybe they say, did. Yes, yeah, some people say they had electricity because there's supposed to be there's one of the drawings on one of the pyramids where they hypothesise it was like a massive light bulb, which I'm. I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, a huge the pyramids just housed one massive Osram light. Bulb. Electric bikes they got on their electric bikes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's been wonderful having you as our guest here today. Actually, it's just Molly. How long have we been talking for there? Minutes. Oh Ooh. my goodness, that's fantastic. We only want thirty-five, so it's fantastic. Is that right? Yeah, yeah it's know, perfect. Perfect. No, so, uh, uh, so Nitin Sawney, thank you so much for being our guest today. Uh, you're one of the only guests, actually, that has well, talk about travelling, visiting yeah. Nelson Mandela, visiting the, the, the Aborigines in Australia, and all on one trip, riding on an elephant. Thank, thank you. you. Jo- thank you for joining us, Nitin. Nice one. Cheers. Well, that was nice. And there goes Nitin riding off onto, into the horizon on an elephant. Yes. And what a convenient tr- method of transport that is from one uh, from Greenwich uh, going round the South Circular, as I believe he is this evening. It'll be <laughs> easily spotted. So if anybody's listening in their car, keep an eye out for a fellow on an elephant because it'll be Nitin. Yeah.